I first came across the idea of extending Timeline years ago through a Unity blog post. It introduced me to how the Timeline system is really just a front end for the Playables API. But it wasn't until recently that I realized how powerful and flexible that system is when you start plugging in your own logic. So today, I'm going to walk you through building a custom Timeline track from scratch using the Playables API. By the end, you'll have a solid foundation for driving not just animation, but real-time gameplay systems directly from Timeline. Let's get into it. While setting up this cutscene inside of this dark forest environment, I decided that the face of this creature was just a little bit too hidden in shadow. So I wanted to add some subtle lighting so that during the cutscene you really see the detail of the creature. But not just that, as part of the cutscene the creature growls and moves and lunges at the camera and I want to change the color of that light as well. Normally, Timeline only controls components like animators, audio sources, or cameras through built-in tracks. So if you want to drive something like a light's color and intensity directly from a clip, you need to create a custom track that knows how to target it. We're going to start by creating a new class called Light Control Behavior, and we're going to include UnityEngine.Playables. This gives us access to the Playables API, which is the system Timeline is built on top of. We're going to use this to extend some of its core types. And the first type we're going to use is Playable Behavior. This is a lightweight, stateless class that Unity instantiates as part of a playable graph, which is the runtime structure behind every timeline. Unlike a mono behavior, this class isn't tied to a game object. Instead, it's part of the graph that Unity builds when timeline plays. It can be created, pooled, and reused internally, so you don't use methods like start or update. Instead, we're going to override lifecycle methods that the playables call into. So let's define a public color field that represents the light color we want to apply while this clip is active. And we can also define a public float that will define the intensity of the light during the clip. Now here's the core method. Process frame gets called by Unity every frame that this clip is evaluated in the timeline. It passes us three things. The playable, representing this node in the graph, frame data, which contains timing information, and player data, which is the object the track is bound to. In our case, this is going to be a light component. So let's attempt to cast player data to a light. This is safe because our track will be explicitly bound to a light in the timeline editor. If the cast fails, maybe the binding is missing, we can just bail out early. If the light is valid, then we can assign its color to the value from this behavior, and this will happen every frame the clip is active. We can do the same for intensity. Together, this makes the clip act like a keyed moment. For the duration of this clip, the light is forced to these values. And that's our complete playable behavior. It doesn't manage state or transitions, just raw evaluation logic. Next, we're going to create a playable asset to represent the timeline clip and hold serialized data that shows up in the inspector. It's separate from the playable behavior. The asset defines what the clip should do, while the behavior defines how to do it frame by frame. Playable asset is the base class Unity expects for anything that can be added to a track. Its key method is create playable, and this is called by Unity when the timeline is building its internal graph. Our job here is to return a playable that defines the logic for this clip. So we'll have two fields here that are exactly the same as in our playable behavior, but they serve a different role. These are the editor facing values. So they're shown in the timeline clip inspector and they're saved with the clip. Later when the clip is evaluated, we'll copy these values into the runtime behavior. Inside of our method, we'll create a new generic script playable, which is going to be a wrapper around our playable behavior. This tells Unity run this behavior as a node in the graph. We can grab the instance of the light control behavior that was just created inside the script playable. And this is our chance to configure it. So let's copy the values from our asset, which comes from the timeline clip, into the behavior. This is how you pass data from the editor world into the runtime graph. Finally, we can return the playable to Unity, and it gets inserted into the playable graph as part of the track's evaluation path. We could actually condense this down to an expression body method if we like, where we just pass in a light control behavior with the values we specify. Next, we're going to create a track asset that's going to represent an entire timeline track. It's what holds and organizes a sequence of clips, and it defines what kind of objects those clips operate on. Without this class, Unity wouldn't know how to bind our custom clips to a light or even allow them on the timeline at all. We're going to leave the body of the class empty for now, but we're going to add two special attributes. The first one tells Unity what type of clip this track supports. In our case, we're saying that this track can contain light control asset clips, the ones we just defined. 
The second attribute declares what type of object this track binds to in the Timeline Editor. When you add this track in the editor, Unity will show a binding field that accepts a light component, and that object will be passed to our playable behavior as player data. Now we can add custom track behavior too as well, and we will in a moment. But first, let's go back to Unity. So back here in the editor, I've already got a game object that I've called Timeline Controller, and I've added a playable director component to it. I've already been working on my sequence, so I already have a playable reference here, which is a timeline asset. I'll just double click it and open up timeline. I'll undock it so that we have a better look at what's going on. We can put it down here in the corner. Now, because we've added a track asset in code, we have a new option here in the context menu. I can choose to add a new light control track here. Notice in the left, we've got an option to supply a binding. You can choose any light or you could drag a reference in as well. Once you've bound that light to the track, you can right click on the track and add a light control asset. Once you have any of these assets selected on your timeline, notice that in the inspector now, you can set any of those values like color and intensity. Now you're able to scrub the timeline and see that change has taken effect, but we also want to change the color at some point, probably close to my roar animation. So I'm going to extend my asset to cover the first part of the sequence. And once the creature becomes more animated, I'll have a different light control asset with different settings. So maybe we can have a red color and we can turn the intensity up. Let's set those here in the inspector for this new asset. Now, once we're happy with our values, which of course we can come back and change any time, we can adjust how this asset sits on the timeline. We could either put it right up to the edge with the other one, or we can start mixing them together. Of course, notice as I scrub over this a little bit slowly, we have a very abrupt change from the white color into the red. Now, this is happening because we haven't introduced a mixer yet. We need a mixer anytime multiple clips on a track overlap. Timeline will evaluate them simultaneously and assign each one a weight, so the mixer will be responsible for blending their outputs into a single result. Without the mixer, only one clip can apply its effect at a time, and there's no way to interpolate between them smoothly. So a mixer represents another node in the playable graph. And just like our light control behavior class, this also inherits from playable behavior. Just like with our earlier behavior, we're going to override the process frame method to run logic each frame. This time, however, we're working at the track level. So we'll be looping through all the active clips and blending their outputs. Once again, let's cast the player data object to a light. And if it fails, we'll bail out early. Then let's initialize three accumulators, one for color, one for intensity, and one for the total weight. These will help us calculate the weighted blend across all clips. We'll get the number of input clips connected to this mixer. Each input corresponds to a light control behavior from one clip on the track. We can loop through each clip that's currently influencing the timeline. For each clip, we get its current weight. This tells us how much it's contributing at this moment in time. If two clips are overlapping, timeline will automatically fade them from one to the next by adjusting these weights. Then we can retrieve the input playable, that is the individual clip, and extract its behavior so we can read the color and intensity values for this frame. Now here's the core blending logic. We multiply each clip's color and intensity by its weight and add that into our running totals. We also keep track of the combined weight so we can decide whether to apply the result. When we're done looping over all of the clips, if there was any active contribution from the clips, meaning the weight was greater than zero, we can apply the blend in values to the light. Now this gives us a smooth transition between clips when they overlap on the timeline. Now there's just one more thing we have to do to put our mixer into play, and that's to come back over to our track asset here. We left a stub for some additional logic. Here, let's override the method create track mixer. Unity gives us the graph itself, the game object that owns the playable director, and the number of clip inputs connected to this track. We're going to return a new script playable that wraps our light control mixer class. By passing in the input count, we're telling Unity how many clip behaviors are feeding into this mixer, which is what enables the blending logic inside process frame. And that's all there is to it. Let's go back into Unity and make sure it's working. So now if I slowly scrub over the mixing area, we can see a gradual change from red to white and back again, depending on which way I'm going. Of course, this will work no matter how big I make the mixing area. So if I grab one of these assets and I just adjust its position a little bit so that we've got a longer area, that'll make the effect a little bit more gradual. Then of course we can change the colors too. So it might be nicer if we had a darker blue color going into the red, 
This might look a little more natural than just a white color. And of course, when we blend through it, it turns a little bit of a purple color as it goes into the red. So we were able to add some custom behavior to timeline with very little code, something you'd normally have to animate manually or bake into keyframes. But by using the Playables API, we gain direct control over runtime logic. We have clean inspector params and even blending, all without touching the animation system. I'll leave a link in the description to the original blog post about extending Unity timeline in case you're interested in reading that. Even though the author doesn't work at Unity anymore, he's still publishing some fantastic assets that I use in every project. And of course, we have several other videos on this channel about the Playables API, specifically about using it for custom animations and for behavior. And maybe one day we can have a video about Playables signals as well. Drop a comment if that sounds good to you. But that's where we're going to wrap it up for today. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you're interested in this kind of content. Join us on Discord if you feel like having conversations with more people just like you. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.